Chapter 5 Helicopter Component Sections and Systems Introduction When introducing the student to helicopter components, sections and systems, the instructor must ensure that the student is familiar with and understands the basic functions and use of each system. Ideally, this is accomplished by use of a static aircraft or a mock-up of the aircraft depicting most of the parts. Allowing the student to touch and explore these components, sections, and systems enhances learning. Knowing the basics of each major component, section, and system gives the student a better ability to recognize malfunctions and possible emergency situations. Understanding the interactions of these systems allows the student to make an informed decision and take appropriate corrective action should a problem arise. Point out to the student what should be checked during pre-flight. In addition to introducing the student to the various helicopter components and systems, the instructor should also educate the student on the different types of materials that are used to make the components and the positive and negative factors of each. If the student understands the various factors of the components, the information can begin to form the basis of component condition knowledge. This should enable the student to better determine the flight status of the components and what failure modes can appear as well as what the record of the material is. Instructors should be creative and attempt to explore comparisons for all helicopter components and systems. There are no two helicopters alike from one manufacturer to another. Flying a helicopter new to the pilot should always include some ground school instruction on the systems and a flight checkout on the specific characteristics of that helicopter. Students should never assume that knowledge of one helicopter system should transfer to another. Airframe design Airframe design is a field of engineering that combines aerodynamics, materials technology, and manufacturing methods to achieve balances of performance, reliability and cost, which can affect both maintenance and flight. Composites, for example, are very sensitive to ultraviolet, UV, radiation from the sun and must be painted to protect them, whereas aluminum has minimum UV degradation from the sunlight but will corrode over time if flown around salt water. Aluminum is light and reasonable easy to fabricate into parts, but composites can be much stronger although more difficult to manufacture. In addition, composite materials seem to suffer from bonding failures. In some structures, this appears as a thickening or expansion, sometimes forming a bubble in an area. Rotor blade design Wooden rotor blades have an infinite fatigue life provided that moisture is kept out of them. The metal attachment fittings on the wooden blade do have a fatigue life, therefore, a life limit is placed on the blade. Although wooden blades are used, they do not perform as well as modern metal or composite blades. Another comparison is composite rotor blades versus metal rotor blades. Composite rotor blades are closer to an on-condition replacement status, potentially saving thousands of dollars for operations but are softer and at least require the leading edge abrasion strip to be replaced. Metal blades are generally less expensive to manufacture. Composite blades may perform better and last longer with less maintenance, but at a higher initial cost. Power plant design When discussing the power plant, comparisons of reciprocating and turbine engines can be explained. A reciprocating engine uses much less fuel than a turbine engine does, but turbine engines can produce much more power from a very light power plant for more flight hours. However, a turbine engine can easily be 10 times the cost of a reciprocating power plant. Turbine engines are usually much more reliable, but failures are often much more dramatic with high-speed shrapnel flying through other structures, causing tremendous damage throughout the power plant. Anti-torque system design Enclosed anti-torque tail rotor systems are usually more resistant to foreign object damage but can be more complicated to build and heavier, which causes them to perform less well than open anti-torque systems. Open tail rotors may perform better aerodynamically with less weight and less cost but are more vulnerable to damage and tend to produce more drag when flown at higher cruise air speeds. Landing gear system design will type landing gear systems are easier to retract for increased cruise speeds with less fuel flow and are much easier to store and move when conducting maintenance. Will type landing gear systems are more expensive compared to skid type landing gear with many more parts to inspect, buy and maintain. They usually have brakes, which also require inspection service, repair or replacement. Skid type landing gear is a simpler design, easier to manufacture and reasonably light in weight. Skid landing gear is a parasitic drag source, which increases exponentially at faster airspeeds. Skid landing gear are less expensive overall but more difficult to move for maintenance or storage and always requires additional equipment on the ground. Inform the student to use care when handling the actual helicopter, training aids, and or training devices. Moving parts, sharp edges, protruding components, and or hydraulic pressures may cause hazardous situations. Material Safety Data Sheets, MSDS, instructions should be reviewed during pre-flight and post-flight if the student comes in contact with any of the fluids in or on the helicopter. Airframe Airframe discussion should explain that the airframe, or structure, of a helicopter can be made of different types of material. 
Figure 5 1 is an example of the many different materials that are used in the construction of a helicopter. The importance of learning the structures and construction materials of the helicopter is to help the student to determine the airworthiness of the helicopter and potential failures and hazards to be found on pre and post flight inspections. The goal is not to make the pilot into a helicopter aeronautical engineer but rather a safe pilot who can understand the full consequences of an unknown condition of a helicopter component. Helicopters can be made of metal, wood, or composite materials, or a combination of the two. A sample piece of the airframe from the manufacturer is a good prop for introducing the student to the different types of materials used. Point out some of the areas that may be made of a variety of materials. One such area is near the exhaust or other areas that must withstand extreme heat for which most manufacturers use titanium. The following is a list of advantages and disadvantages of aluminum and composites that help a student learn about each. Aluminum advantages, predictable strength, which is certified by the manufacturer of the metal and which is recorded with each batch. The metal conductivity enables a single wire electrical system to be used, which saves weight and complexity. The metal conductivity maximizes antenna reception and transmission. Recognize lightning strike properties and protection. Minimal UV degradation from sunlight. Controllable moisture problems, such as corrosion. Will transmit loads and can bend without failure. Good bonding techniques can eliminate P static for better radio reception. Smoothness of construction is predetermined. No extensive sanding or filling is required. Paint chips do not materially affect the integrity of the underlying aluminum. The Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, readily accepts it as a construction medium and is knowledgeable about its physical properties, causing minimal delays in the certification process. Disadvantages, form blocks must be built to hydroform the metal in a soft state which then has to be heat-treated to regain its strength. Due to the setup of the hydroform process, there is a high per-unit part cost unless large batches are produced at one time, in which case inventory carrying costs increase. Thin aluminum, as used in general aviation aircraft, cannot be compound-curved and still carry structural loads, thereby increasing drag in some areas if improperly engineered. Antennas need to be exposed for proper operation, necessitating the use of very expensive, low-drag antennas for high speed. It is almost impossible to build laminar flow wings with the skin thickness used in general aviation aircraft. Any flexing of the structure promotes metal fatigue and can suffer from structural failure. Operation under certain conditions, ocean salty air, corrosive chemicals found in agricultural operations, can lead to corrosion caused structural failures. Composite construction advantages, ease of construction in small lots. These planes are typically assembled by individuals in their garages. Low cost for one-off projects as minimal tooling is required. Can be compound curved for maximum drag reduction and still carry structural loads. Electronic transparency means antennas can be hidden inside for streamlining without loss of reception. Easier to get smooth surfaces for laminar flow designs, which contributes to some additional speed. Cracks do not usually propagate in composite structures. Structures can be stronger for lightweight components. Disadvantages, strength varies from batch to batch. Difficult to detect voids. Since there is no metal frame, there is no common ground, a two-wire electrical system is required. Without any electrical conductivity, there is very poor lightning strike protection. Ultraviolet light degradation due to sunlight. Delamination problems due to moisture. Composites tend to break without warning at failure loads, unlike aluminum which can bend and still survive, and usually provide some warning prior to failure. Poor electrical bonding causes static interference with radios. Requires expensive paint maintained in perfect condition, without chips or scratches, to keep sunlight and moisture out, otherwise, composites degrade like an old fiberglass boat. Poor acceptance by the FAA due to unknown physical properties, such as aging and delamination. Very labor-intensive to construct repeatable components. Composites do not afford any fire or heat protection and can be the source of deadly fumes in the case of an accident or fire. Composites require new tools and machines to repair. Fuselage perhaps one of the best teaching devices for the fuselage discussion is an actual helicopter. Better yet is a helicopter with all or most outside panels removed or undergoing major maintenance or inspection. This open view provides an opportunity for the instructor to point out, literally, to the student engine housing, transmission, avionics, flight controls, and the power plant. Also, the student can view the seating arrangement for your particular helicopter as you identify where the pilot, crew, passengers, and cargo are seated or placed. Figure 5-2, main rotor system rotor blade design in theory can be very complex to a new student. 
Discussion should begin with simpler designs and then move towards the more complex as the student's understanding progresses. A cutaway of the main rotor assembly is a useful tool for instructors in a classroom environment. This allows students to see how each input from the cyclic and the collective affects the hub assembly. A static helicopter is also very helpful in demonstrating the moving parts of the hub assembly. Explain to the student that the purpose of the main rotor is to produce lift. Show the student the main parts of the mast, hub, and rotor blades. The three basic classifications of main rotor system are rigid, semi-rigid, and fully articulated. Main rotor systems are classified according to how the main rotor blades are attached and their movement relative to the main rotor hub. Show which rotor system is installed on the student's particular helicopter and how it is identified. Discussions with the student regarding the different types of main rotor systems can be accomplished with additional manufacturer drawings. Pay particular attention to the type of main rotor system that the student will be flying. By now, the student probably has read about the different types of rotor systems but may not fully understand the differences. Explain to the student identifiable characteristics of each rotor system that make it different from the other system types. Also, be ready to answer the student's questions about the advantages and disadvantages of each type of system, cost, and maintenance requirements versus ride quality, performance, reliability, and durability. Rigid rotor system When introducing the rigid rotor system, instructors should explain that the system is mechanically simple, but structurally complex because operating loads must be absorbed in bending rather than through hinges. Figures 5 to 3 and 5 to 4, the rigid rotor was developed by Irvin Culver, 1911 to 1999, of Lockheed Aircraft Corporation to bring the simplicity of fixed wing flight to helicopters. In a rigid rotor system, the blades, hub, and mast are rigid with respect to each other. The rigid rotor system is mechanically simpler than the fully articulated rotor system. There are no vertical or horizontal hinges so the blades cannot flap or drag, but they can be feathered. Operating loads from flapping and lead slash lag forces must be absorbed by bending rather than through hinges. By flexing, the blades themselves compensate for the forces that previously required rugged hinges. The result is a rotor system that has less lag in the control response because the rotor has much less oscillation. The rigid rotor system also negates the danger of mast bumping inherent in semi-rigid rotors. The rigid rotor can also be called a hingeless rotor. Explain the other advantages of the rigid rotor system to the student, for example, a reduction in the weight and drag of the rotor hub, higher control loads. Without the complex hinges, this rotor system is much more reliable and easier to maintain than the other rotor configurations. Rigid rotor systems require flexible rotor blades to produce a tolerable ride quality, but allow better maneuverability. Semi-rigid rotor system discuss with the student the main parts of the semi-rigid rotor system. Explain that it was named for its lack of the lead lag hinge that a fully articulated rotor system has. The rotor system can be said to be rigid in plane because the blades are not free to lead and lag, however, they are not rigid in the flapping plane through the use of a teeter hinge. Therefore, the rotor is not rigid, but not fully articulated either, it is. Semi-rigid. The parts of the semi-rigid rotor system that should be identified are teeter hinge, blade grip, blade pitch change horn, and pitch link. Note. The swashblade assembly is described on page 512. Also, discuss the difference between teetering, flapping, versus feathering. On any rotor system, flapping occurs when the blade moves up and down. On a rigid rotor system, this occurs when the blade bends. On an articulated system, the blade flaps up and down around a teetering hinge. On a two-bladed, semi-rigid teetering system, the blades flap in unison around the flapping hinge, such as in a Bell 206. The semi rigid main rotor system is designed such that as the blades cone and flap for different airspeeds, the rotor blade center of gravity centers around the teetering hinge such that the flap down is mostly cancelled out by flap of the other side. Examples of the semi rigid rotor system are found on the Bell 230, the Bell 222, figures 5 to 5, 5 to 6, and 5 to 7, and the Bell 206. Figure 5 8, point out to the student that the Bell 206 head does not include coning hinges. Instead, the rotor head is designed with a pre-cone angle to the blade retention system, and other coning forces are simply dealt with by bending of the blades. When discussing the semi-rigid rotor system, instructors should explain that some are designed with an underslung rotor system which mitigates the lead-slash-lag forces by mounting the blades slightly lower than the usual plane of rotation so the lead and lag forces are minimized. As the blades cone upward, the center of pressure of the blades are almost in the same plane as the hub. Further explain that if the semi-rigid rotor system is an underslung rotor, the center of gravity CG is below the mast attachment point. 
This underslung mounting is designed to align the blade center of mass with a common flapping hinge so that both blade centers of mass vary equally in distance from the center of rotation during flapping. The rotational speed of the system tends to change, but this is restrained by the inertia of the engine and flexibility of the drive system. Only a moderate amount of stiffening at the blade root is necessary to handle this restriction. Simply put, underslinging effectively eliminates geometric imbalance. Fully articulated rotor system Fully articulated rotor systems can accommodate larger loads and faster airspeeds with good ride quality. Because there are more blades, the load can be spread among them resulting in lower initial angle of attacks which allows the retreating blade more margin above stall which allows increased forward airspeed before VNE. They have increased expenses due to the many parts that make up the rotor system, which also make preflight more complicated. The fully articulated Rotor system is also susceptible of ground resonance if certain factors coincide. As with the other types of rotor systems, the student should have read about the fully articulated rotor system. Figure 5-9, the student should be able to use the solidity ratio to explain how each blade carries only a portion of the total load. It is about the wing loading, in pounds, to the total area of the wing, in square feet. The instructor may need to review with the student basic aerodynamics of airfoils and airflows necessary to develop lift. Full articulation is also found on rotor systems with more than two blades. Using the rotor, show the student how the fully articulated system allows each blade to lead and lag, flap up and down, and feather. Figure 510, the purpose of the drag hinge and dampers is to absorb the acceleration and deceleration of the rotor blades caused by Coriolis effect. Figure 511, older hinge designs relied on conventional metal bearings. By basic geometry, this precludes a coincidental flapping and lead-slash-lag hinge and is cause for recurring maintenance. Newer rotor systems use elastomeric bearings, arrangements of rubber and steel that can permit motion in two axes. Other than solving some of the above-mentioned kinematic issues, these bearings are usually in compression, can be readily inspected, and eliminate the maintenance associated with metallic bearings. Elastomeric bearings are naturally fail-safe and their wear is gradual and visible. The metal-to-metal -metal contact of older bearings and the need for lubrication is eliminated in this design. Coning or flapping hinges allows the blades to flap up and as air speed is increased, allows the main rotor blades to flap due to differences in the relative wind speeds. Figure 511, feathering hinges allow the main rotor system blades to change pitch individually as they cycle around the rotor disc to allow for direction thrust control application. This is a good time to reiterate to the student what was covered in the helicopter flying handbook, Chapter 4, Helicopter Flight Controls, and how each input from the controls, cyclic and collective, independently or collectively affects the rotor system. Figures 5 to 10 and 5 to 11 depict how the blade acts in its rotation about the mast. Explain to the student that the blade is normally kept in a horizontal plane during its rotation by centrifugal force. However, high winds during run-up or shutdown when the blades are turning at a low speed could affect this, and cause damage as well. The damage occurs when the blades flex up or down greater than normal. Another factor to consider is how the flapping force is affected by the severe rigor of the maneuver, rate of climb, forward speed, aircraft gross weight, hard landing, etc. Coning or flapping hinges allow the blades to flap up and as air speed is increased, allows the main rotor blades to flap due to differences in the relative wind speeds. The feathering hinges allow the main rotor system blades to change pitch individually as they cycle around the rotor disc to allow for direction thrust control application. Explain to the student that modern rotor systems may use the combined principles of the rotor systems mentioned above. Some rotor hubs incorporate a flexible hub, which allows the blade to bend flex, without the need for bearings or hinges. These systems, called flexures, are usually constructed from composite material. Elastomeric bearings may also be used in place of conventional roller bearings. Elastomeric bearings are constructed from a rubber-type material and have limited movement that is perfectly suited for helicopter applications. Flexures and elastomeric bearings require no lubrication and, therefore, require less maintenance. They also absorb vibration, which means less fatigue and longer service life for the helicopter components. Bearingless rotor system When discussing the bearingless rotor system, explain to the student how the structures of the blades and hub are manufactured differently to absorb stresses. Bearingless rotor systems, such as the Eurocopter systems, have contact surfaces or load points made of elastomeric composite components that deform and twist to allow blade movement. Most of these components are on condition life items versus metal components which must be changed at certain times due to metal fatigue. The composite components are designed so that even if a portion fails, the aircraft can make a safe landing. Figure 512, the hingeless, bearingless, rotor system functions much as the articulated system does, 
but uses elastomeric bearings and composite flexures to allow flapping and lead lag movements of the blades in place of conventional hinges. Its advantages are improved control response with less lag and substantial improvements in vibration control. It does not have the risk of ground resonance associated with the articulated type unless the landing gear system needs servicing. The hingeless rotor system is also considerably a more expensive system. Tandem rotor on a tandem rotor helicopter, two rotors turn in opposite directions at opposite ends of a long haul. The rotors are usually synchronized through a transmission system so that the main rotor shafts can be little more than a blade length apart. Tandem rotor helicopters operate a little differently from the single rotor variety. Tandem rotor helicopters have no tail rotor, so there is no translating tendency to combat, but there are pedals for directional control at a hover. The cyclic control, which is used as it always has been in single rotor helicopters, has not changed either. Figure 513, one deviation to the tandem rotor system is the side-by-side -side twin rotor system. Figure 514 shows an example of the Cayman K-Max intermeshing, side-by-side, -side, rotor system, which dates back to the old H4 Husky, and is a modified tandem rotor system. It is optimized for external load operations, and is able to lift a payload of over 6,000 pounds, which is more than the helicopter's empty weight. The K-Max relies on the two primary advantages of Syncropter over conventional helicopters, one, it is the most efficient of any rotor lift technology, and two, it has a natural tendency to hover. This increases stability, especially for precision work in placing suspended loads. At the same time, the Syncropter is more responsive to pilot control inputs, making it easily possible to sling a load thus to scatter seed, chemicals, or water over a larger area. Coaxial rotor system students should be shown the coaxial rotor system, which consists of a pair of helicopter rotors mounted one above the other on concentric shafts, that is one shaft inside another with the same axis of rotation, but that turn in opposite directions. Figure 515, explain that this configuration is a feature of helicopters produced by the Russian Komov Helicopter Design Bureau. Coaxial rotors solve the problem of angular momentum by turning each set of rotors in opposite directions. The equal and opposite torques from the rotors. Upon the body cancel out. Rotational maneuvering, yaw control, is accomplished by increasing the collective pitch of one rotor and decreasing the collective pitch on the other. This causes a controlled differential of torque. Coaxial rotors reduce the effects of dissymmetry of lift through the use of two rotors turning in opposite directions, causing blades to advance on either side at the same time. One other benefit arising from a coaxial design include increased payload for the same engine power. A tail rotor typically wastes some of the power that would otherwise be devoted to lift and thrust, all of the available engine power in a coaxial rotor design is devoted to lift and thrust. Reduced noise is a second advantage of the configuration. Part of the loud slapping noise associated with conventional helicopters arises from interaction between the airflows from the main and tail rotors, which in the case of some designs can be severe. Also, helicopters using coaxial rotors tend to be more compact, occupying a smaller footprint on the ground, and consequently have uses in areas where space is at a premium. Another benefit is increased safety on the ground, by eliminating the tail rotor, the major source of injuries and fatalities to ground crews and bystanders is eliminated. The coaxial rotor system has the following disadvantages, 1. Mechanical complexity. 2. Poor hover performance characteristics of the smaller rotor disc in higher altitudes and warmer climates. 3. Heavier, stiffer blades required to prevent the blades from flexing into the other rotor rotating in the opposite direction. 4. Heavier rotor head and hub components to control and retain the heavier blades. Swashblade assembly explained to the student that the rotating swashblade couples stationary cyclic motion with rotating cyclic control. Movements. The drive link ensures that the rotating swashplate stays synchronized with the main rotor as it turns. The anti-drive link and lever are attached to the aft side of the inner ring and swashplate support, preventing rotation of the inner ring. Point out to the student where these controls are connected. Also, point out, if installed, the stationary swashplate, rotating swashplate, pushrods, anti-drive link, univall, and pitch horns. Figure 516, during pre-flight inspect for obvious damage, condition, and security of all components. Explain to the student that there are several different mechanisms for transmitting cyclic and collective inputs to the main rotor system. The Robinson R22 and R44 have the swashplate mounted on a monoball. This allows the entire swashplate to slide up and down on the rotor mast, for collective inputs, and tilt for cyclic inputs. Figure 517 shows how the swashplate slides up and down to transmit a collective pitch change. Figures 5-17 and 5-18 should be used by the instructor as references. 
demonstrating to the student the actual movements on the helicopter is a better option, if available. Figure 517 depicts how collective inputs affect the swashblade assembly. The red arrow is pointing to the bottom of the swashblade, A, B shows the entire swashblade has moved up the mast. Note the effect on the pitch lengths. Small hash lines show that in B, the pitch link has moved up along with the swashplate. Compare the top of the pitch link and the left-hand coning hinge bolt in the two pictures. Since the entire swashplate has moved up without changing its tilt, the pitch links have all moved up a set amount, but continue to move up and down during rotation in response to the tilt of the swashplate. Figure 518 depicts how the cyclic inputs affect the swashplate assembly. Notice that the swashplate in A is basically level, while in B it has been tilted. The tilt forces the pitch link to move up as it travels to the right-hand side of the picture, and move back down as it travels to the left-hand side of the picture. As it moves up and down, the blade pitch increases and decreases. Note, on some helicopters, the control rods were routed internally up through the main rotor mast to protect them. On those helicopters, the cyclic inputs come down from the top of the mast and the swashplate is under the transmission, where it is all covered and protected from wires, and strum. Anti-torque systems tail rotor explained to the student that the tail rotor is required on a single rotor helicopter to overcome the torque effect. This torque effect is the result of the fuselage turning in the opposite direction of the main rotor system. Figure 519 depicts the main rotor blades turning counterclockwise in the fuselage, torque direction, turning clockwise in order to compensate for the unwanted torque of the fuselage. On a static aircraft, show the student how the inputs of anti-torque pedals affect the pitch change in the tail rotor. Discuss with the student the emergency procedures for loss of tail rotor authority, loss of tail rotor thrust, loss of tail rotor components, forward CG shift, a break in the tail rotor drive system, and fixed pitch settings. Point out to the student the different parts of the tail rotor, if installed, including the pitch change tube, pitch change link, and the cross head assembly. Figure 520, the Bell Model 427 tail rotor assembly shown in Figure 520 has an internal control rod which is designed this way for protection. Demonstrate that as the crosshead assembly moves in and out, it will change the pitch angle of the tail rotor blades via the pitch change link and pitch horns. When left pedal is applied, control tubes are moved and the lever assembly retracts the control tube. As the control tube retracts, the crosshead moves closer to the yoke assembly, tail rotor blade pitch is increased. Show how the tail rotor is much like the main rotor, except it is turned on its side and provides thrust instead of lift. Another way to describe the tail rotor is to compare it to an airplane propeller which also generates thrust and does not provide lift. Reinforce to the student the importance of keeping the anti-torque pedals free of obstructions and having full range of movement. Emphasize that if a loose object fell during flight and were not retrieved, it could jam the pedals and reduce aircraft controllability. Other types of anti-torque system explain to the student that there are several different types of anti-torque systems. One is the fenestrin, or fan and tail, design. A fenestrin is a fully enclosed tail rotor. It is essentially a ducted fan. The housing is integral with the tail skin, and, like the conventional tail rotor it replaces, is intended to counteract the torque of the main rotor. Fenestrins have between 8 and 18 blades. These may have variable angular spacing so that the noise is distributed over different frequencies and thus, is quieter. The housing allows a higher rotational speed than a conventional rotor. Allowing it to have smaller blades. Figure 521 the smaller diameter allows use of higher fan speeds and sometimes requires higher fan RPM ranges to equal thrust from a much larger unducted system. The housing, although somewhat heavier, does offer some protection on the ground and is more streamlined in forward flight. Discuss with the student that propellers and rotors alike are designed to be less than transonic at the tips. The other type of tail rotor is the Natar system, no tail rotor. The Natar system represents the first significant configuration change to conventional helicopters since 1939 when Igor Sikorsky flew the first conventional rotorcraft. The new system uses the Coanda effect of air flowing over or around the surface of the tail boom to create lateral lift. This counteracts the torque of the main rotor. The Natar system shortens drive shafts, gearboxes, and the rotor unit itself. This reduction in the parts count is a distinct advantage over conventional tail rotorcraft. Figure 522 in operation, the Natar system draws low pressure air in through an air intake located at the top of the airframe to the rear of the main rotor shaft. A variable pitch fan pressurized the tail boom to a relatively constant 0, 5 pounds per square inch. The air is fed to two starboard side slots and a direct jet thruster. The slots provide the necessary anti-torque force. The rotating jet thruster provides direction control. The two slots are located at 70 and 140 degrees, and allow ejected air to mix with the main rotor downwash to establish the Coanda effect. 
The main rotor downwash is normally dissipated as essentially symmetric separation on both sides of the tail boom in a hover. The pressurized boom inject low pressure air at 250 fps onto the coanda surface, outer surface of the tail boom, which results in the deflection and produces about two thirds of the required anti torque force. This force is predictable. It is controlled by the appropriate location of the slot and control of the air jet that exits from the slot. In other words, the tail boom reacts like an airplane wing, only sideways. The increased air speed over the starboard side of the tail boom causes lateral lift, pushing against the torque forces trying to spin the helicopter clockwise. This is the same result that a tail rotor achieves when it propels the tail in a counterclockwise motion. The main rotor downwash skews as velocity is increased, and the circulation control slot is uncovered, resulting in proportional loss of anti-torque force. The vertical tail surface provides the directional stability with forward speed. In sideward flight, the effective angle of attack is changed as a function of the main rotor thrust and sideward velocity inflow effects. When the downwash is altered by motion other than hovering, the system reduces the coanda effect, and the thruster picks up more of the load. This keeps the system forces balanced. The tail fin, which does not come into play when hovering, also becomes effective when flying forward. The direct thruster provides the remaining one-third of the force needed to counter the torque of the main rotor. The thruster rotates, moving the opening either to the right or left. In this way, directional control is achieved. Engines discuss the different types of engine that may be found on most modern helicopters, reciprocating, or piston, and turbine. Discuss with the student the emergency procedures for engine-related problems, such as loss of power, underspeed, or rapid increase in power, overspeed, while in flight. Authorized fuel types for a specific engine should also be topics of discussion at this time. Reciprocating engine, piston, explain that the reciprocating engine is the most widely used power plant in light helicopters and is designed to specific standards of reliability. It must be capable of sustained high power output for long periods. Explain to the student the cycle of the reciprocating engine, as depicted in figure 523. Discuss the intake cycle, induction stroke, fuel-slash-air mixture, compression cycle, fuel-slash-air mixture ignited by spark plug, power cycle, burning mixture expands, and the exhaust cycle, burned gases escape. The manufacturer may be able to provide a diagram of the internal components of the reciprocating engine. This allows further discussion with the student of the internal workings of the engine. It is very important for instructors to teach the student to understand what the engine is supposed to do, how it works while flying and what happens when something breaks and how the pilot should react. The instructor should be able to discuss the octane requirements of a gasoline engine or jet fuel classifications if teaching in a turbine engine powered machine. Some engines require the settings to be changed for different fuels. The instructor must ensure the student can determine the difference between jet fuel and OGAS when something the tanks. Explain that besides smell and the oiliness tests, there is the white paper test, where a drop is placed on a piece of white paper or paper towel. Ufgas will leave a distinctive ring from the dye in the fuel whereas jet fuel tends to leave an oily yellow ring. Turbine engine explained to the student that the turbine engine is also widely used today on larger and most all of the military helicopters. Because turbine engines have a continuous combustion process which allows more horsepower to be developed form a smaller unit. Since the power is developed from circular rotation instead of reciprocating motion, power is smoother and engine stresses are reduced which contributes to reliability. The expense comes from the high temperature tolerant materials and close tolerance manufacturing processes needed to produce the turbine engine. A turbine engine provides a high power to weight ratio, which a reciprocating engine cannot provide. Some have a power to weight ratio three times that of the piston engine. Turbocharged or supercharged piston engines can operate well at high altitudes. Weight per horsepower and reliability are the main factors favoring the turbine engine. Explain that the working cycle of the turbine engine is similar to that of the piston engine, i.e. induction, compression, combustion, and exhaust. One other difference is the fact that the piston engine combustion, power, is intermittent, in the turbine engine, each process, cycle, is continuous. The manufacturer may be able to provide a diagram of the internal components of the turbine engine. This will allow further discussions with the student regarding the internal workings of the engine. Figure 524 is an example of a turbine engine. The instructor should also explain the increased fuel usage in a turbine engine is due to the continuous combustion process, and the fact that approximately the first 50 to 60% of the engine's power is required to sustain the engine's induction and systems such as the oil system and electrical generator. This accounts for a turbine engine's high idle speed. A turbine engine may idle at 16,000 revolutions per minute and generate maximum power at 38,000 revolutions per minute. 
Turbine engine power curves are very steep and it may need 6 to 10 seconds or longer to begin generating large increased power demands. There is very little extra power available at close to idle settings from turbines. Usually, turbine engines must be above 80 to 90% RPM to develop moderate power output. This is the reason to keep turbine engines under power loads to have the power available if needed. Show the student the main parts of the turbine engine, compressor, combustion chamber, turbine, and accessory gearbox assembly. Then, discuss what each section is doing during flight or 100% power, as depicted in figure 524. Many helicopters use a turboshaft engine to drive the main transmission and rotor systems. The main difference between a turboshaft and a turbojet engine is that most of the energy produced by the expanding gases is used to drive a turbine, turboshaft engine, rather than producing thrust through the expulsion of exhaust gases, turbojet engine. The instructor should fully understand and be able to explain that the turbine and four-stroke helicopter engines both have four cycles, intake, compression, power, and exhaust. This continuous combustion process is the main limitation due to material limitations. The extreme heat and centrifugal forces place tremendous stress on the rotating parts of the combustion section. When operating helicopters with turbine engines, instructors should teach the student about starting batteries and the different characteristics of a lead acid and NECAD, nickel cadmium, batteries. Lead acid batteries generally do not have the energy density per pound of the NECAD batteries, but cost much less and have much lower maintenance costs. Lead acid batteries also tend to have a sloping power output curve that can allow the operator to perceive impending failure and replace the battery. However, lead acid batteries must be specially designed to withstand the deep charge that happens during a turbine engine start. The student should be reminded of the differences between the start times of a reciprocating engine, a relatively short period of time, and the prolonged turbine starting sequence, lasting 30 to 60 seconds not counting a cooling period of the internal engine. Temperatures are initially too high. Additionally, the battery for a turbine engine installation must be designed with sufficient residual reserve to furnish cooling rotation in the event of an aborted or hot start. NECAD batteries have much higher energy densities for their weight and, most significantly, can withstand the long, very high current drain necessary to start a turbine engine in cold temperatures. One advantage of NECAD batteries is the almost flat output power curve. The uniform output provides consistent turbine starter activation. Unfortunately, NECAD batteries produce a very flat consistent discharge power output which suddenly and rapidly decreases at the end of its charge, and this means that it can be very difficult to determine if the battery is at full capacity or towards the end of the charge curve. To receive proper service and consistent turbine starts, battery voltage and battery charge indications must be closely and consistently monitored for long-term, gradual changes and be maintained in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. This usually requires completely discharging and charging the individual battery cells. Most manufacturers then require that batteries be reassembled with equal output cells for best results. For more information on starter batteries, the instructor should review Chapter 10 of the Aviation Maintenance Technician, General Handbook. As a reminder, 1. The compressor draws air into the plenum chamber and compresses it. 2. That air is directed to the combustion section where fuel is injected into it. 3. The fuel-air mixture is ignited and allowed to expand. 4. This combustion gas is then forced through a series of turbine wheels, causing them to turn. 5. Turbine wheels provide power to both the engine compressor and the accessory gearbox. 6. Power is provided to the main rotor and tail rotor systems through the freewheeling unit, which is attached to the accessory gearbox power output gearshaft. 7. During the starting process, Follow the manufacturer's requirements closely for hot or slow starting procedures. A fully charged battery will help in most cases. 8. Always follow the manufacturer's cool-down procedures to allow internal parts to settle to cooler uniform temperatures as much as possible before engine shutoff. Now, briefly explain what each section comprises and any emergency actions related to each one. Compressor The compressor is similar to a fan. As air is drawn inward, Stator vanes act as a diffuser at each stage, decreasing air velocity and increasing air pressure. The high-pressure air then passes through the compressor manifold where it is distributed to the combustion chamber via discharge tubes. Discuss with the student the phenomenon of a compressor stall, engine surges. Explain to the student how reducing the airflow might correct the condition. This is accomplished by activating the bleed air system, which vents excess pressure to the atmosphere and allows a larger volume of air to enter the compressor to install the compressor blades. Help the student understand the compressor air control system installed in the helicopter and explain the probable failure modes. If the inlet guide vanes fail closed or if a bleed air valve fails open, 
the pilot will notice much higher engine combustion temperatures at lower power settings with the maximum power available being very limited. If the guide vanes fail open or the bleed air valves fail closed, high power operations will probably be normal but compressor stalling and possible flameouts may occur as the power demand is reduced. Combustion chamber The combustion chamber is where the fire takes place anytime the engine is running properly. An igniter plug connected to the combustion chamber ignites the fuel-slash-air mixture only when starting the engine. If installed with an auto-relight, the igniter may attempt to automatically relight the fuel-slash-air mixture in an engine flameout condition. Discuss with the student what is done if the engine should flame out during flight. Altitude and time available should be mentioned as well. Turbine discussions about the turbine need to be tailored to the specific helicopter that is being flown as each there are differences in how the two sections of the turbine are coupled to the drive line. For example, the Rolls-Royce, formerly Allison, Bell Jet Ranger and BO-105, Lycoming engines, Stars, and Pratt & Whitney, BH-212, are free turbine engines with separate shafts for compressors and power turbines. Older Gazelle and Alouettes use a single shaft turbine with a centrifugal clutch to allow starting, much like the older and often larger reciprocating engine-powered helicopters. Turbines will always have the two sections of compression and combustion. What varies is how the sections are coupled to the drive line. Common in most helicopters now is the free turbine design, which uses one inner shaft from the combustion section turbine to drive the accessory gearbox. Oil pump, fuel pump, starter slash generator and the compressor to sustain the engine. This is typically called the N1NG. A separate outer shaft around the inner shaft driven by the power output turbine will usually goes through the gearbox to be reduced in RPM and support the output drive shaft. This is typically called the N2 and is dedicated to driving the main rotor, tail rotor, drive system, and other accessories such as generators, alternators, and air conditioning, if installed. Help the student correlate possible emergencies, such as NR slash NG overspeeds, to what is happening in the turbine and ensure that the student understand why the steps being taken for the emergency procedures help alleviate or control the problem so that they can safely land the helicopter. Memorizing emergency procedures is part of the beginning learning process for students, but the ultimate goal should be to help them recognize the onset of a system slash component failure, and then how to properly react to ensure a safe landing. Transmission system explain to the student the purpose of the transmission system. It transfers the work done by the engine to the main rotor, tail rotor, and other components of the helicopter that rely on engine propulsion. Discuss the main components of the transmission and where they are located on the helicopter. 1. Main rotor transmission 2. Anti-torque drive system 3. Clutch 4. Freewheeling unit 5. Rotor brake, if installed, point out the location of the oil level sight gauge. Also, point out the location of chip detectors that are associated with the transmission and engine, if detectors are installed. Identify the location of the warning lights on the pilot's instrument panel. Chip detectors give advance warning of possible excessive engine or transmission wear, which could prevent an impending failure. This early warning can also greatly reduce the cost of engine and transmission overhaul. The chip detectors illuminate warning lights when metal chips bridge the gap in the magnetic probe of the chip detector. Note, some helicopters use chip detectors that have burn-off capability, fuzz burners. When a metal chips bridge the gap in the magnetic probe a warning light is illuminated on the instrument panel. The chips are automatically charged with an electrical current with the ability to eliminate most small particles. Main rotor transmission explained to the student that the main rotor transmission is designed as a gear reduction, reducing engine power to rotor revolutions per minute, RPM. With a horizontally mounted engine, the transmission changes the axis of rotation from the horizontally mounted engine to the vertical axis of the rotor shaft. In many helicopters, the transmission also supports or carries the entire weight of the helicopter. Because of this, the transmission brackets should be checked on pre-flight for stability and condition. Explain to the student that the rotor RPM is kept at a predetermined setting during normal flight. During auto rotation, the rotor RPM must be maintained by the pilot to continue a normal rate of descent. Remember, very low rotor RPM is unrecoverable as the blades will fold up and airflow will not increase the RPM. Discuss with the student that a high rotor RPM during auto rotation increases the rate of descent. Low rotor RPM initially slows the rate of descent, however, if RPM is allowed to decrease excessively, the helicopter may fall almost vertically. Little or no collective is available at the bottom of the auto rotation. Maintaining the auto rotation RPM that is set by the helicopter manufacturer is important. Figure 525 depicts various types of tachometer used to maintain slash monitor the rotor RPM. Anti-torque drive system explained to the student that the drive system may be exposed or placed inside of a covered tail boom depending on the type of helicopter. 
Point out to the student the different parts of the tail rotor drive system, if installed, such as the hanger bearings, flex couplings, input seal, and output seal. Also, point out what to look for during pre-flight, leaks, loose fittings, or obvious damage. The instructor should ensure the student understands the common failure modes and weak links. For example, the witness pins on the shafts at the couplings, coupling packs, slippage marks, and metal particles indicating a movement between the surfaces, or onto loose rivet. The tail rotor gear box should also be covered at this time. Fluid levels and attaching hardware are important pre-flight items to check. Figure 526, clutch explained to the student the purpose of the clutch, if installed, on the helicopter, and how a centrifugal clutch works. A centrifugal clutch is a clutch that uses centrifugal force to connect two concentric shafts, with a driving shaft nested inside the driven shaft. The input of the clutch is connected to the engine crankshaft while the output may drive a shaft, chain, or belt. As engine RPM increases, weighted arms in the clutch swing outward and force the clutch to engage. The most common types have friction pads or shoes radially mounted that engage the inside of the rim of a housing. On the center shaft, there are assorted extension springs, which connect to a clutch shoe. When the center shaft spins fast enough, the springs extend, causing the clutch shoes to engage the friction face. It can be compared to a drum brake in reverse. When the engine reaches a certain RPM, the clutch activates working. This results in waste heat but, over a broad range of speeds, it is much more useful than a direct drive in many applications. Those using the belt clutch system must be very careful to ensure full engagement and engagement procedures. Excessive throttle can quickly ruin an engine because there is no load during the initial starting, so the engine can speed past its RPM red lines very quickly. Those events require expensive teardowns and overhauls. Most large helicopters use a clutch during the start sequence and then gradually engage the rotor system to normal operating RPM. Free turbine engines do not need a clutch because there is little load from the rotor system. The rotor slowly starts turning during the start sequence and gradually achieves normal operating RPM. Explain to the student that there are three main types of clutch found on reciprocating helicopters. 1. Centrifugal clutch. Briefly explain how the centrifugal clutch operates and how to determine if the clutch is operating normally, using the rotor tachometer. 2. Belt drive clutch. Briefly explain how the belt drive clutch operates and how to determine if the clutch is operating normally using the rotor tachometer. Show the student the location of the pulley belts and that the pilot must check for frays, tears, or cracks on the belts during pre-flight of the helicopter. 3. Sprag clutch. Explain how the sprag clutches have inclined ramps and rollers. If the drive shaft is faster than the driven shaft, the rollers are forced against the ramps and the clutch locks up and transmits full power. If the driven shaft is turning faster than the driving shaft, the rollers retreat down the incline and allow the driven shaft to rotate freely, hence the freewheeling clutch. Note. A clutch is used to disconnect the engine from the rotor load to enable a starter motor to turn the engine for starting. Some turbine helicopters have a centrifugal clutch gas cell, that engages the rotor system above about 28,000 revolutions per minute. Also, the R-22, R-44, and HU-269 series use belt clutches to allow the engine to be started without excessive loading. The older Hillers and Bell 47 series machines use centrifugal clutches mounted above the engines. Freewheeling unit explain to the student that all helicopters are fitted with a form of freewheeling unit. Also, explain the purpose of the freewheeling unit and where it is located on the helicopter. The freewheeling unit makes auto rotations. Possible by disconnecting the dead or failed power plant from the transmission and removing the drag from the rotor system. One of the most popular types is the sprag clutch. The freewheeling unit allows the engine to drive the rotors but does not allow the rotors to turn the engine. When the engines fail, the main rotor still has a considerable amount of inertia and still tends to turn under its own force and through the aerodynamic force of the air through which it is flying. The freewheeling unit is designed to allow the main rotor to rotate now on its own regardless of engine speed. This principle is the same as being in a car and pushing the clutch in, or putting it into neutral while the car is still moving, the car coasts along under its own force. This occurs regardless of what is done to the accelerator pedal. Fuel system explained to the student the parts and functions of the fuel system. Figure 527 illustrates a typical gravity feed fuel system. Show the student how to properly check the fuel for water or other contaminants. Also point out to the student the location of the fuel shutoff valve in case of an emergency. If installed, show the student how to operate the hand-operated fuel primer and why a primer if installed for a carburetor engine must be closed and locked for proper engine operation. Explain to the student the purpose and parts of the engine fuel control system and the location of the system. Each type of helicopter, reciprocating or turbine engine, 
requires a different type of fuel control, and each one also has a different type of delivery for the fuel control. 1. Reciprocating engines have a carburetor or are fuel injected. 2. Turbine engines have several types of fuel control systems. A. Full authority digital engine control, FIDEC, engine is electronically controlled with no mechanical connections. Requires electricity to fully operate and function. B. Mechanical units, no power is needed, it is all mechanical and is reliable but not as efficient. C. Hydro slash mechanical hybrid units have some characteristics of both. Usually older versions of early attempts at FIDEC type systems. Many had a manual reversion capability. Show the student the major components of the fuel control system, if installed. Two types of fuel control system that are used today by most modern turbine helicopters are the FIDEC and Analog Electronic Engine Control, EEC. True FIDECs have no form of manual override available. In case of FIDEC failure, giving the computer full authority over the operating parameters of the engine. If a total FIDEC failure occurs, the engine fails. If the engine is controlled digitally and electronically but allows for manual override, it is considered an EEC or electronic control unit. An EEC allows the pilot to continue to operate the engine with the throttle while in emergency mode, manual mode. Electronic supervisory control allows the pilot to override the digital side of the fuel control and operate in the analog mode during emergency mode of operations. Note, many turbines still utilize the older type electronic fuel control systems, which may not be quite as efficient as the newer systems, but operate without electrical power and are quite reliable. Manual operation is easily possible. Engines reciprocating engines carburetor explain to the student the need to make adjustments to the carburetor, full rich to leaning the mixture, and why. Refer the student to the FAA approved rudercraft flight manual, RFM, and point out the specific procedures for a particular helicopter. Discuss with the student what the indications are if the fuel mixture is too rich, engine seems rough slash reduced power, or leaned out too much, high engine temperature, possibly damaging. The mixture in most cases should be adjusted on the ground because an overly lean mixture can cause the engine to stop, resulting in a forced auto rotation and attempt to restart the helicopter in flight. Carburetor ice figure 528 depicts how ice affects the carburetor. Discuss with the student why ice may form on the internal surfaces of the carburetor. Carburetor ice has two sources, one, venturi cooling from air expansion and two, fuel vaporization absorbing heat. Both effects combine to cool moisture in the air to below freezing. In some installations, the Venturi effect can cause icing around the butterfly in fuel injection systems, but it is a rare instance. Recommend reviewing FAA Advisory Circular, AC, 20-113, Pilot Precautions and Procedures to be Taken in Preventing Aircraft Reciprocating Engine Induction System and Fuel System Icing Problems. Also, discuss the indications of carburetor icing, for example, decrease in engine RPM or manifold pressure, carburetor air temperature gauge outside the safe operating range, and engine roughness, and how to correct for the icing condition. Point out to the student the FAA-approved RFM procedure for carburetor heat. Engine RPM should decrease as hot air is introduced into the engine because hot air is less dense. If the engine RPM does not decrease, the flight should be cancelled until the defect is corrected and ensure that a deficiency entry is made into the helicopter's logbook or maintenance tracking sheet. Explain to the student that figure 529 is a depiction of how a typical carburetor heat system functions. Remind the student at this time that if too little carburetor heat is applied and ice kills the engine, the freewheeling unit will prevent restarts of the engine without use of the starter. Fuel injection explain to the student how the fuel injection differs from the carburetor system and why the system eliminates carburetor icing. When there is no carburetor, airflow is controlled by butterfly but no need for venture because the fuel is injected under pressure which reduces the cooling effect. Also if the fuel is infected at the intake port of the engine, the fuel vaporization temperature drop doesn't enter into the situation at all. Even if the fuel is injected at the butterfly, it vaporizes en route to the cylinder so the temperature drop occurs inside the warm engine where there is plenty of heat. Electrical systems show the student the electrical diagram that is provided by the helicopter manufacturer and discuss with the student the major components and functions of the electrical system. Explain how each system works with one another from the start sequence through the power off sequence shutdown. At a minimum, show the student the location of the following items, if installed, and most importantly explain the function failure modes of the various components and enough about the locations for a thorough pre-flight 1. Battery 2. Battery switch 3. Starting vibrator 4. Ammeter, discuss how to read it and what the numbers indicate, 5. Starter switch 6. Starter 7. Alternator 8. Alternator switch 9. 
All circuit breakers and switches, note, FAA policy states that if a non-essential circuit breaker pops up or opens, do not reset in flight. If it is an essential circuit breaker, allow one reset only. Resetting circuit breakers could result in an in-flight fire. For more information, refer to the Special Airworthiness Information Bulletin, CE 1011R1. For a student flying a turbine-powered helicopter, point out the starter-slash-generator. A starter-slash-generator load indicator is often located on the pilot's instrument panel to indicate the condition of the starter-slash-generator system. A turbine helicopter pilot should fully understand the difference between a load meter and an ammeter and what the indications really mean in order to understand what the real failure is and the correct procedure to follow. Flight is still possible during a total loss of electrical power, and students should be taught to remain calm and safely land the helicopter. The engine continues to operate normally without electrical power. The battery, if fully charged, provides a limited time of power for items such as radios. Also, discuss the steps to take in the event of electrical circuit breakers tripping or fuses burning out. Electrical fire in flight should be covered as well. Hydraulics Hydraulic systems vary slightly with different helicopter designs. Pilots must understand the system on the specific helicopter that is being flown. Not all helicopters rely on hydraulic assist for the control inputs, and smaller helicopters usually do not use hydraulics in an effort to keep total weight of the airframe down. Larger helicopters, like to heavy, incorporate hydraulics to overcome high control forces. The discussion should begin with showing the student the manufacturer's hydraulic schematic and indicating where the pressure and return lines are located. Walk through the entire hydraulic system, showing the student the location of components and explain what the basic functions are of each component. Hydraulic system components always refer to the proper rotorcraft flight manual for the specific hydraulic system that the helicopter is equipped with. The following is a list of hydraulic system components and their functions with which the student should be familiar. Hydraulic reservoir, the reservoir has three lines, overboard scupper drain, systems return line, and the pump supply line. The pump supply line uses both gravity feed and pump suction to keep the hydraulic pump supplied with fluid. The reservoir may be pressurized to prevent cavitations for helicopters that are capable of higher altitudes and to ensure positive control pressure. The hydraulic reservoir is usually located higher than the hydraulic pump to ensure adequate fluid gravity flow to the pump and is mounted on a bracket, which is located near the transmission. A window is provided on the cowling for inspection of the sight glass. A sight glass is provided to determine when the reservoir needs servicing. Normal fluid level is indicated when hydraulic fluid completely fills sight glass or on some helicopters, is filled to a set level on the sight glass. Hydraulic pump, provides the pressure to operate the servos and the entire system pressure is regulated by the pump via the pressure line. If the pump is driven off the transmission and it fails, there is usually a shear shaft which breaks to allow the transmission to keep rotating so that the helicopter can be landed safely. Other systems drive the pump from the engine. An engine failure will also include a hydraulic failure. The pilot must understand the system on the specific helicopter being flown. Quick disconnects, usually seen from the cabin roof and need to be checked for security. What is important is that the student understands how to ensure that the quick disconnect fittings are fully seated and locked together. The quick disconnects located on the pressure side are where fluid flows through from the hydraulic pump. On the return side, the quick disconnect is the last component through which the fluid flows before returning to the hydraulic reservoir. These components allow maintenance to isolate the hydraulic reservoir and pump from the hydraulic system. Filter bypass indicator, the pressure and return filters both have a pressure indicator that should be checked during pre-flight. When the indicator is in the reset position, it will be flush and not seen. An extended red indicator indicates an impending filter stoppage. The system is also affected by low temperature, pressure surges and excessive vibration. The red indicator pops out when a set differential pressure across the filter is exceeded. The difference in pressure is not the same for all helicopters, therefore, instructors should teach students what the pressure differentials are for the helicopter being flown. Once the red indicator pops it will remain extended until it is reset manually. Refer the student the proper rotorcraft flight manual for reset procedures. Bypass check valve, the helicopter is equipped with a bypass system and there is an obstruction in the filter causing a pressure differential, the differential point will be different for each hydraulic system. The bypass valve will open and allow unfiltered fluid to flow directly to the reservoir. This feature allows the pilot to safely land the helicopter with the hydraulic system still working. Relief valve, part of the hydraulic system, and located between the pressure and return portions of the hydraulic system. The unit protects the system from overpressurization in the event of a hydraulic pump malfunction. Solenoid valve, designed to provide pressure to the system when it is denergized. 
The solenoid valve is de-energized when the hide cyst switches in the hide cyst position or in the event of loss of electrical power to the valve. Placing the hide cyst switch to the off position will energize the valve and pump pressure will be blocked with the system pressure connected back to the reservoir. Hydraulic system switch, located inside the cockpit. When the hydraulic switch is placed in the hide system position, the solenoid is de-energized. The solenoid is then energized when the hydraulic switch is placed in the off position. This system is a fail-safe system which requires power to disable. Therefore, pulling the circuit breaker for the hydraulics might restore the system if it happens to be an electrical control problem. If the hydraulics have failed, it is most important for the hydraulics to be switched off to ensure the hydraulic system does not come back online when large control forces are being applied. A gross over-controlling situation could result which could lead to damaging the helicopter. Pressure manifold, a distribution point that permits hydraulic pressure to evenly flow to all actuators. Pressure switch, the switch opens if the hydraulic pressure ever becomes low. The pilot should see an indication in the cockpit that the hydraulic pressure is low. External check valves, prevent reverse flow of the hydraulic fluid from the actuator when pressure is lost. The return line check valve permits the return fluid from the directional control actuator to flow out of the actuator, and then pack into the inlet port. When hydraulic pressure is lost, this type of design permits the directional control actuator to remain full of fluid and prevents feedback forces in the flight controls. Servo actuators varies with each helicopter design, but a common hydraulic system will have four servo actuators, one directional, one collective, and two cyclic. Return manifold, fluid leaves the actuators and travels through the return manifold and recycles through the return filter. The fluid then passes through the quick disconnect coupling to the hydraulic. Hydraulic system failure explain to the student what the procedures are if a hydraulic system failure occurs. Discuss with the student the difference in control after a hydraulic system failure while at a hover or in forward flight. Hover is difficult because of the tendency of over-controlling the helicopter and the stiffness of the controls. A run-on landing is a suitable option during a hydraulic system failure. Note, some hydraulic systems operate at pressures exceeding 1,000 pounds per inch to, psi. Students should be cautioned about searching for hydraulic leaks while the system is still under pressure. The system accumulator can have high system pressure for long periods of time after shutdown, and if any part of the human body is exposed to such high pressure streams, those streams can act like a needle and puncture the skin injecting the toxic fluid into the body. Stability Augmentation Systems, SAS, the Stability Augmentation System, SAS, was developed from an earlier method which prevented the cyclic from flopping around, force trim, which would hold the cyclic control only in the position at which it was released. Force trim was a passive system that simply held the cyclic in a position which gave a control force to transitioning airplane pilots who had become accustomed to such control forces. Students should learn that SAS is an active stabilization system that helps the helicopter track the position of the cyclic relative to the horizon. Some systems are designed to use as much as 10% of the total servo travel to control the helicopter. This is achieved automatically without inputs from the pilot. With this type of system installed, the pilot workload is reduced. The helicopter is a bit more stable with SAS installed, and it dampens unwanted helicopter movement during flight and at a hover. Instructors should show the student the SAS actuators, which are mounted on the hydraulic servos, and are fed information from gyros that sense the pitch, roll, and yaw axes of rotation. Important information to relay to the student is that the SAS requires power, both for the stabilization platform and for the actuators. Like any other helicopter system, they are subject to failure and instructors need to discuss emergency actions that may be required if the system were to fail. Autopilot explained to the student that the more sophisticated SASs have additional features, such as an autopilot. As suggested, the autopilot can perform certain duties as selected by the pilot. Some of the basic systems perform only basic functions, such as heading and altitude. Some of the advanced systems perform certain functions, such as climb-slash-descent rate, navigation capabilities that track to points and some fly instrument approaches to a hover without any additional pilot input. Autopilot is widely used by the United States Coast Guard to assist in search and rescue and to recover the helicopter during adverse weather conditions, as well as in many turbine-powered helicopters which allows for single-pilot IFR operations. Note, it is important to refer to the autopilot operating procedures located in the RFM, if autopilot is installed. Environmental systems, heating slash cooling, explain to the student that many smaller helicopters only have doors as part of their environmental systems. Show where the doors will be stored and how to properly store all loose equipment and seat belts. Once the doors are removed, stress the importance of a clean and secure cabin. 
Many accidents have occurred when objects have blown from the cabin and damaged both the main rotor and tail rotor. Pilots have lost maps, charts, sunglasses, cushions, jackets etc. from the cabin or cockpit. Flapping seat belts can also cause unnecessary damage to the side of the helicopter in flight. Show how the ram air functions and the location of any levers that are used to control ram air. If installed, show the location and controls of the air conditioning unit. The pilot should be well versed in the operation and restriction of use of the air conditioning unit. Many units are restricted from use during takeoffs and landing due to power demands. Ensure the student refers to the RFM for the proper operating procedures. Discuss the cabin heating system with the student and locate the heater ducts and switches that control them. Piston-powered helicopters use a heat exchanger shroud around the exhaust manifold, and turbine-powered helicopters use a bleed air system for cabin heat. Any other systems that use forced air or heat should be discussed at this time, such as defog blowers for the main windscreen. Anti-icing systems first and foremost, students need to understand that anti-icing is the process of protecting against the formation of frozen contaminant, snow, ice, or slush on a surface. Icing can occur as the helicopter sits overnight or during flight. In either case, icing becomes a hazard and if not attended to can be disastrous. Include the following topics when discussing anti-icing systems, engine anti-ice, carburetor icing, pre-flight and deicing. Engine anti-ice discuss with the student the importance of using the engine anti-ice system if certain conditions are encountered and the loss of performance when the system is in use. The instructor should be able to explain why the engine anti-ice decreases power so much. The following information should be explained to the student. 1. Engine anti-ice uses bleed air to heat inlet. 2. The bleed air exits the inlet area into the inflow which decreases the air density due to the high temperature air. 3. Although the anti-ice may keep the engine operating, everything else is still subject to icing. Real icing conditions dictate an immediate exit from those conditions. 4. The windshield is subject to icing on the exterior and fogging on the interior from the crew and occupants breathing. Rarely do helicopters have windshield anti-icing or deicing certification. Carburetor icing Carburetor icing can occur during any phase of flight, and it is particularly dangerous when you are using reduced power, such as during a descent. Explain that the pilot may not notice it during the descent until trying to add power. Teach the student about the possible indications of carburetor icing, decrease in engine RPM or manifold pressure, the carburetor air temperature gauge indicating a temperature outside the safe operating range, and engine roughness. Because changes in RPM or manifold pressure can occur for a number of reasons, closely check the carburetor air temperature gauge when in possible carburetor icing conditions. Show the student that the carburetor air temperature gauges are marked with either a yellow or green caution operating arc. Instructors should refer the student to the FAA-approved RFM for the specific procedure regarding when and how to apply carburetor heat. In most cases, you should keep the needle out of the yellow arc or in the green arc. This is accomplished by using a carburetor heat system which eliminates the ice by routing air across a heat source, such as an exhaust manifold, before it enters the carburetor. Pre-flight and deicing instructors should stress the importance of checking for fuselage and component icing when doing the pre-flight with a student. Rotor blades, pitot tubes, and engine parts are all susceptible to icing and should be checked thoroughly before starting the helicopter. Explain that de-icing is the process of removing frozen contaminant, snow, ice, slush, from a surface. Deicing of the helicopter fuselage and rotor blades is critical prior to starting. If possible, show the student a helicopter that has been sheltered from the elements and then compare it to one that is not. Helicopters that are unsheltered by hangars are subject to frost, snow, freezing drizzle, and freezing rain all of which can cause icing of rotor blades and fuselages, rendering them unairworthy until cleaned. Asymmetrical shedding of ice from the blades can lead to component failure and shedding ice can be dangerous because it could hit any structures or people that are around the helicopter. The tail rotor is vulnerable to shedding ice damage. Thorough pre-flight checks should be made before starting the rotor blades. If any ice was removed prior to starting, ensure that the flight controls move freely. While in-flight deicing systems, i.e., helicopters so equipped, should be activated immediately after entry into an icing condition. Instructor tips, always supervise the student when first introduced to the helicopter. Figure 531, point out to the student the danger areas and the sharp portions of the helicopter. Show the student the no-step areas, if present. Allow the student to touch each component of the helicopter as it introduced and say the name of the part. On the next pre-flight, the student should begin to describe the function of each part, and on every pre-flight after that, the student should be asked the next component or components in order of the checklist until the student has learned the functions of each component of that specific helicopter. 
If appropriate, tell the student well ahead of time what will be covered during the next lesson and what the student should study or reference. The student should always be briefed in a quiet area so there are no distractions that can take their attention away from the discussion. Chapter Summary The components, sections, and systems that were covered in this chapter were described so you as the instructor can convey this information to your student. This is your guide to further create a lesson plan and teach the student the whys of the helicopter components, sections, and systems. What was not covered in this chapter was the responsibility of the instructor to also introduce the student to the helicopter service reports, what they mean, and how to obtain them.